Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, the mighty God, the ancient of days, the glorious Father. The hour has come. Come and have your way this great and amazing night. Come and touch each and every one of your children that have gathered tonight. Father, come and be part of this prayer message, Lord. Come and bless this message. Come and bless the atmosphere. Fill us with your spirit. But Father, in a special way, we also know that we are sinners, and so we ask for mercy tonight. Come, therefore, and wash us with your most precious blood, mighty Jesus. For we cannot proceed in the course of this message of fellowship without settling with you, Lord Jesus. And so, Father, have mercy on us according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We cover our destiny with the blood of Jesus. We cover our hearts with the blood of Jesus. We cover the atmosphere, the blood of Jesus, the message of this night, and even the messenger, we cover with the most precious blood of Jesus. We cover the ministry with the most precious blood of Jesus. And so, Father, we are here to receive your word. And so take control of this prayer meeting tonight. Let your name be glorified. And we stand against every ugly wind that may blow to cause distraction to someone who have come to receive the word of God tonight. May that evil wind be arrested tonight in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We cover ourselves with the word of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. And amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We we'll give you glory, Lord, for your message that you have come to give to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. My dear friends, tonight I welcome every one of us to the hearts of Jesus and Mary Ministries. And we shall be taking a quick reading from Matthew chapter number 26, verse 40 to 41. I repeat. Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 to 41. Father Lord, as we are about to read this scripture, we ask that the power of your word that we are about to hear shall penetrate into us, penetrate into our hearts. And let your word be resident in the hearts of your children. May your word never fall on an unproductive heart, but let it fall on the heart that is rich, on the heart that is that, that will be able to receive and retain your word tonight. Father, only you can do this. And so have your word, Jesus. We we'll call upon the Holy Spirit to empower us to understand the very word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 to 41. And we shall be reading from the New Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to, De to Peter, so, could you not stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus. Mighty God, we have heard your word from the scripture. 
We ask you to enlighten us, to understand what you want to reveal to us tonight. May your word bless your children. Amen. And amen. My dear friends, today marks volume 7 in our series when under attack when under attack that is spiritual attack in the reading of today we see Jesus talking to his own people talking to his disciples he came to them in Gethsemane, a place where there was attack against Jesus. That night, Jesus knew that this was the night of an attack against him, and he went into prayer. Jesus was in a Gethsemane praying. Very serious prayer. All his mind was there. He did not allow distractions. He found his disciples sleeping. When they were supposed to be awake. And he asked them. So would you not keep or stay awake with me even for one hour? And Jesus now tells them, say, look, stay awake and pray. Matthew 23, verse 41. Stay awake and do what? And pray. That you may not come into the time of trial. That the trial, the temptation, the, the, the attack may not overpower you. So Jesus is talking to us tonight to stay awake and to pray when we find ourselves in the season of a spiritual attack. When under spiritual attack, it is not a time to sleep. It is not a time to relax. It is not a time to just assume that everything is okay. How can a soldier be sleeping in the camp of his enemy? How can a soldier be sleeping when his enemies are around him? No good soldier does that. Except the soldiers of Christ. Because we who call ourselves God's children, we sleep when we are supposed to be awake praying. Look at what Jesus told his disciples. Stay awake even if it is one hour. Pray even if it is one hour. And Jesus saw that indeed their spirit was desiring to pray, was willing to pray. But the flesh was weak. Fortunately, the flesh overpowered them. Meanwhile, they were with Jesus. And somebody began to wonder, how could these people be with Jesus and they and their, their flesh will over, uh, overtake them. They did not ask Jesus for strength. Remember the principle of ask and you shall receive. They did not ask Jesus for strength. Jesus himself was there asking his father for strength. And his father granted him strength. 
to go through that trial. But the disciples of Jesus did not ask Jesus for strength. And so the flesh, the power of the flesh, overtook them. Even though the spirit was willing, but their flesh was weak. That is a wrong thing that should happen when a child of God is going through a season of a spiritual attack. He should be strong in prayer. Like Jesus, he should stay awake praying. I'm not soliciting that you will not sleep at all and you pray all night, but this sleep I'm talking about now is not just a physical, uh, is not just physical sleep. You see, there is what is called a spiritual sleep. Somebody is spiritually weak. He is spiritually asleep. He is ignorant of what is happening around him. Because when somebody is sleeping, don't forget. The person doesn't even know what is happening around him or her. When a child of God does not know what is happening around him or her, he is sleep, sleeping spiritually. And for such people, St. Paul says, Awake, O sleeper. Awake. <laughs> Let them who are sleeper, who are sleeping, let them wake up. Awake, O sleeper. When someone is sleeping, that person is completely ignorant of what is happening. Many children of God are not aware of what is happening around them. They are not spiritually sensitive. Their eyes are blind. The symptoms of spiritual attack is very evident, but they don't see it. Because they are not so spiritually sensitive. They don't have problem looking at the sky and seeing that it's about to rain. Or the sun is about to heat. They could predict the weather, but they cannot predict the danger, the spiritual danger that is coming. Such a child of God is asleep. He does not understand the spiritual things. We have to learn how to be spiritually sensitive. Those in the medical area tell us that one could avert certain episodes or crises in, in, in his or her health if such a person understands the symptoms of that disease or situation or, or that health matter. For example, it is known that Someone suffering from a heart attack would have signs of heart attack. So even if the person does not know that a heart attack is encroaching or imminent, but if the person is aware of the signs, the symptoms, that suggests or that are allude to heart attack, then the person will know that, oh, I am having a, I think I'm encroaching danger of heart attack. And so, when such a person begins to see the symptoms, then the person will take actions immediately to arrest the situation so that it doesn't get out of hand. So knowing the symptoms 
of a certain health disorder helps to save life. There is a chance of survival for such a person because the person is able to see the symptoms of that situation, of that attack, of that healthy problem. You see that? So medical advancements has always made it possible for us to see these warning signs. To see these warning signs. They may be common, common warning signs. But even though they are common, they can save life. The person may feel this certain discomfort or certain pressure, maybe in certain part of the body, maybe certain pain could be a sign of danger. Not every pain will be of much concern, but as a part of your body, you see something, you feel certain pain, you know that this is not normal. This is, this is a sign of danger. If someone is having shortness of breath, you know that hmm, this is not normal. You see that? Now, in a similar way, many Christians seem to be blindsided by spiritual attacks. They don't recognize the warning signs. Of imminent spiritual attack. So, in this message, opportunity is given to us to observe, to take note of the symptoms or warning signs of a spiritual attack so that we can be able to take note of this and be able to survive. It is crucial to recognize the warning signs for survival. Because God wants us to survive, so he gives us these signs. I crave your indulgence tonight to pay attention to this message. We have to pay attention because this is a matter of life or death. The enemy that is fighting us wants us to die. And I'm not trying to fight anybody, but that's what it is. John 10.10 10 tells us that the enemy has a mission to kill, simple, to destroy, to steal. We cannot allow him to steal us. To steal our blessings, to steal what God has given to us. We cannot allow Him to kill us, to kill our dreams. No. We cannot allow Him to, to, to destroy what God has given to us. And so, number one, number one symptom of a spiritual. is loss of spiritual desire. Loss of spiritual desire. Let me tell you something, you see. The goal of any spiritual attack is to turn someone away from what God wants to do in the life of that person. That is the the, <laughs> the, the, if, if the enemy achieves that, he has achieved something serious. If he succeeds in turning you away from what God wants to do in your life, for the enemy, it is a mission accomplished.
And that is why the first warning sign of attack is a loss of spiritual desire. You begin to lose spiritual drive. You don't feel like going to pray again. You don't feel like going to church. You don't feel like you're joining the prayer line. You don't feel like a fasting. You used to get up in the night when men are sleeping, when people are sleeping. You used to get up to pray, but now you don't even get up to pray again. You don't find the joy in prayer again. You may spend three hours in call or in the Facebook, in the social media, just interacting with your friends, but when it comes to prayer, oh my goodness. Well, let me leave it to find day. It is a sign of danger. If, if that is happening to you, know that the enemy is not far away from you. Look at what David said the other day. The moment I heard, let us go to the house of the Lord, I was filled with joy. You see? His desire was to be in the presence of God. When your desire is no more that which will bring you to the presence of God. Know that you are already under attack. This is this is this is a sign that the enemy is already coming close because he wants to weaken you before he attacks you. And to weaken a child of God is to disconnect such a child of God from prayer. Because prayer is the strength of the child of God. Prayer is the key. Prayer is the master key. The enemy knows that. So he begins to disconnect such a person from prayer. I shared with you some time ago, this was many years ago, before even I got into ministry. For years, by God's grace, I don't even know how God does the kind of some of these things, but by, by his grace, it, it was... A grace I found to be getting up early in the morning by maybe 5.30 a.m. I just dress up and go to morning mass. I was doing this for a couple of years. It became part of me. I don't need to set an alarm to get up early morning and just dress up and go to church. Morning mass. I had no problem getting up in the night to do some night vigil. Pray in the night, cast some little sleep and see, wake up and go to morning mass. This, took, this kept taking place every time. And then on Thursdays, of course, Thursdays would be all night prayer vigil for me. But then, there was all of a sudden, I find myself not waking up in the night to pray, and I sleep till daybreak. So I cannot, wouldn't pray in the night to do my night vigil, and I will not be able to go to morning mass. This happened the first day, second day, up to a week. Ah. <laughs> uh, Thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit. While I was wondering what was wrong with me, why, why, why am I finally going to pray again? I never knew I was on attack. I began to set an alarm. My alarm will, most of the time, it, whether it rings or not, I don't even know. When I woke up, it not, I found out that alarm did not wake me up. And I wasn't the type that, that, um, could sleep in a noisy place. A little thing could wake me up while sleeping. But how come alarm will be ringing and I will not wake up? And then the Lord spoke to me clearly and audibly. 
during that time. And today, my son, you are under attack. The enemy is encroaching. And I cannot forget the words he used. He said, he, the enemy understands that your strength is a prayer. So he wants to weaken you. He wants to dis attack your prayer life. He's not attacking you directly. He's attacking your prayer life so that when he weakens you, when he messes up your prayer life, then he can come and attack you. The enemy understands how to fight. He understands warfare strategy. Give me the devil is a warrior if you don't know that. We must be in Christ, the supreme warrior, our general, in order to overcome him. You cannot at, at, outwit the enemy by us wisdom. No, no, no fleshly power can overtake us. Uh, can make us to overcome him. We must be anchored in Christ. So you understand the message. That when we begin to feel loss of spiritual desire, Loss of prayer, desire for prayer. When we begin to feel these things, know that that the enemy is, is preparing the ground to attack you. You may not have become under direct attack at that point in time, but it's preparing the ground to weaken you first. You see, in even in the physical uh, strategy to fight an enemy, it's, you know, one of such is to weaken your enemy first before you attack your enemy. That's it. That has proved to be very uh, successful, even the military. Have you found out why the, in the field, in the military, you know, one of the ways you can weaken your enemy is to surround your enemy, cut off the source of food supply. If you cut off the source of food supply to your enemy, surround your enemy, just surround your enemies, your, your enemy territory, for one week, the soldiers will, will come out on their own and raise up their hands, surrendering. You know why? Because you are weakening them. They need food to be strong. They need food to fight. But when you cut off food, cut off water supply, they are finished. Except from the air, they are able to drop food for them, but otherwise they are finished. It is true physically. It is also true in the spirit. If the enemy cuts us from prayer, cuts us from fellowship, we are finished. We are finished. When the enemy, the, I'm talking in terms of military now, in physical battle uh, engagement, if the enemy surrounds their own enemy, if someone surrounds their enemy or his enemy, find out that he, the, the, he may not or they may not attack their enemies at that point in time. But they know that by weakening them, by surrounding them, by cutting off food supply, they are weakening them. And over time, the enemies will begin to come out. Voluntarily, the enemy will come out. Surrender. The enemy, spiritual enemies, they know how to do the same thing. We should not allow ourselves to become ignorant of the devices of the enemy. So when you begin to feel lack of prayer, when you begin to feel like, oh, I mean, I don't want to go to prayer line today. Tomorrow, I don't want to go. Next morning, I don't want to go. Be careful. <laughs> yeah, the enemy is already packaging something. The opportunity is there for you to come to the prayer line, but you're not coming. One week. Mm. There was this day I saw one writing. I wish I could remember what I saw in that writing. I think that writing says, seven days without prayer makes one, makes one week. Seven days without prayer makes one week. You know that there are seven days in a week. And that week is W-E-E-K. But that thing I came across says, and I love what, I believe that, and I agree with, I agree with whoever wrote that thing, and, and, and the, the, the person said that um, 
not not praying for one week, okay, makes one week. So the week now is no more W E K but W E A K week. Spiritually weak. Okay. Seven days of prayer. <laughs> You don't wait for you don't need to wait for seven days before you know you are spiritually weak. But they're trying to pass a message. The person is trying to to put a, a kind of um something that uh, matches the fact that there's, there's a, that in one week there are seven days. So one week is seven days. I'm saying that one week without prayer makes one week. So, okay. Seven days makes one week. That we know. Seven days make one week. W E E K. Okay. And the seven days without prayer <laughs> makes one week. W E A K. So it, it, I, I hope you understand what I'm talking about. So you see, we should not allow ourselves to be weakened. Whatever thing that will cut us off from prayer or from reading the Bible, from going to Mass, from going to Jesus, the Blessed Sacrament, from praying our rosary, whatever thing that will disconnect us from prayer is not from Jesus. It is from the, is from the kingdom of darkness. This is very critical. We must be able to know that when we feel like we don't need to pray again, it is an attack. When we are no more passionate about the things of God, we are already under attack. That's a plan to invade us, to attack us. We must find pleasure in the things of God. So don't forget this. When you begin to suffer from loss of spiritual desire, it is a, a, a warning sign. In fact, it, is a, a, it should be the first warning sign because the enemy wants to weaken such a child of God before he comes to attack. So when you begin to see yourself no more coming to prayer and other things, going to church and praying the way you're supposed to pray, know that please, that's what this message is pointing out tonight, know that you are under spiritual attack. Know that the enemy is packaging to destroy you. Number two. Physical fatigue. It, let me explain this. It is normal for someone to be to feel tired. It is it is part of human nature. You overstress yourself, then you feel fatigue. You feel fatigue. So at the surface level, fatigue doesn't sound to be something spiritual. Okay? But you see, the enemy understands that we are created beings. We are we are human beings. We're not we're not God who is uh who is not tired, who cannot be fat uh, who cannot be fatigued. We have spirit, we have soul, we have body. The spirit may be willing but the body is not willing. The body wants sleep. The body says, you know, why not leave this prayer till tomorrow? You know, this fast thing you are doing, why don't you, uh, why not go and break this fast? Why not go and eat this, this food? But this thing you said you will not do. Why not do it? You know, after all, God understands. So you, you see the body exercising is power. The body has power. Power weakness. When you are fasting, you try to control the body, you try to bridle it. 
But the body tries to tell you, look, I'm hungry. Feed me. Give me food. The body tells you, this man that offended you, why not, why not hit him back? You see that? <laughs> now, now, when the body is weak, even though your spirit wants to pray, but your body is weak, your spirit is telling you, pray, pray. And then you, you want to get up, but then you, you, you fall, you just fall out, you just uh, yield to fatigue, and you, you slip off. If this becomes a pattern, it is no more normal. It is no more normal. Take it from me today. If it happens once in a while, that is a part of human nature. Okay? But when this becomes predominant, know that you are under attack. You look at what Jesus told his disciples when they were in Gethsemane. Is that not our reading today? In Matthew chapter 26, verse 4 to 41. And he came to, to the disciples at Gethsemane and found them sleeping. The body was what? Under fatigue. So they were sleeping. They were sleeping when they were not supposed to be sleeping. They were sleeping when they were supposed to be praying. Jesus was praying. The master was praying. But his subjects were sleeping. That doesn't sound normal. If the master is awake, the servant should be awake. That's how it goes. In fact, as a matter of fact, the servants must wait for the master to sleep before they sleep. And so Jesus in Matthew 26 verse 49 told Peter, So you could not stay awake with me for one hour? Peter? I say, stay awake and pray that you may not fall into the temptation. But the spirit is indeed willing. You see that? But the flesh is what? Weak. Under fatigue. That was the case of the disciples of Jesus. They were under fatigue. Overtaken by weakness. <laughs> Jesus understands that this is not normal. And he told them, pray, pray. Pray. Is Jesus telling somebody something tonight? <laughs> you see, many times we face our greatest attacks. Just before a great promotion comes. Or just before a great victory comes. Not in all cases, but most of the time that's what it is. Keep in mind, when you are going through it, an attack could very well be an indication that you are about to be promoted. Or just had a great victory. So, when you begin to feel fatigue, in a way that, that is not normal, you should know that the enemy is attacking you. There was this time, the Lord told me, this happened many years ago, ministry had not even started at that time, and I was the Lord told me to get into prayers. He didn't tell me how long, so I began to pray. I began to pray. Um, I think I gave myself like three days prayers, fasting and prayers, because the Lord said so, uh, told me to pray with the fasting. But I, by the time I, I, I got to the three days, it was so interesting that I, I extended to one week. And the, the spirit was moving and it was so, so full of joy that I extended it to two weeks. Now I'm talking of even plus night vigils. It was an intensive prayer. And before I know what's happening, 
I extended to one month. Now he continued to 119 days. I'm saying this for a reason. Now, during that prayer, uh, prayer session, that long se- prayer session, there was a time I traveled, okay, uh, and uh, that, that trip must be done. So I left my wife and, and traveled. Now, uh, in the night, <laughs> it, it was time for us to pray. The time we used to pray, that time had come. Meanwhile, I was I was away, not available for you know to, to tell my wife it's time to pray. So so she woke up, but she was so tired to make that prayer. She was overcome by by physical fatigue. Of uh, God bless her with a, a baby that time. So the struggles of baby and all that added to the fatigue. But you see. Even though she, she she just slumped on bed and got to sleeping, then she told me and she said that that someone was banging on the wall, bam, bam, bam. The thing woke her up. And she looked at her, she couldn't see anybody. And she looked up again. Someone banged again on the wall, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> My time that happened about three times. She knew this was God waking her up, and of course. Strength was given to her. When God comes, especially when we ask Him for strength, even in our moments of fatigue, He gives the strength. He will give the strength. And understand that this fatigue we are talking about should not be taken for granted. It is so corny because of the fact that we have physical fatigue that comes by our human nature. And you see the enemy taking advantage of that to bring his own fatigue, a fatigue that is uh, sponsored by the enemy. So it is by, by discernment that we can be able to know when this fatigue is no more normal. When this fatigue is sponsored or promoted by the enemy, it is the Holy Spirit that tells us the boundary. Remember the man. <laughs> Hell! Jesus. You ask yourself, am I under fatigue? This prayer that I, this fasting I have planned to do, that I have not done for some time. I have planned to do it uh, since last month, but I have been postponing it till now. Could it be that the enemy is, the enemy doesn't want me to do that. That's why he's, he keeps bringing fatigue. Distractions. That fatigue is a distraction. <laughs> Jesus. Number three, sign of spiritual attack, warning signs of spiritual attack is what I may call spiritual dryness. Spiritual dryness. You appear to be like as if you are in the desert. It appears that you, you, you lose concentration. Everything appears to be dry. It appears as if there's no more life. Your resources, as if your resources are dried up at the same time. in the family, no joy in the family, no joy in the, in the place of work, no joy even in the church, no joy in prayer. You have gone to kneel down to pray, but after three hours, you find that you're not actually prayed. You're just there marking time 
confused. Is God talking to somebody tonight? But you are planning to pray. And you have many times to pray. You have come to the chapel to pray. You have gone to an open night to pray. But you are not praying. You see that? <laughs> he puts you in a state of worrying. Instead of worshipping, you are worrying. Attack. When a child of God begins to worry, it is a remarkable sign of attack. Worry. Jesus said, do not worry. For your heavenly father knows what you need. Okay? You you appear disconnected from the very one that gives you strength. You appear disconnected from God. It appears as if God is far away from you. It appears in that situation as if God is far away from you. But these are the suggestions of the enemy. To make you think you're alone. To make to pull you into making decisions on your own. Not based on what you believe that God wants you to do. He wants you to make decisions based on opportunity. Not based on an anointing. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. You see, l let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, you see. There are two times, two seasons in one's life when a child of God is most especially vulnerable to temptation. There are two seasons, two seasons in a life in the life of someone, in one's life, you know, when such a child of God is most vulnerable to temptation. Number one, when you have nothing. When a child of God has nothing. And when a child of God has everything. These are two extremes that are dangerous. When he has nothing, the enemy comes to tempt him. Okay? So that he could... The enemy wants to take advantage of the fact that the child of God has nothing. To promise a child of God to do something wrong so that he or she can get something in a way that violates Christian principles. And you understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> See that? Temptation to do what is wrong, to get what is not right, or what you think is right, but because we need it desperately, we violate the ordinances of God. That is temptation. The enemy waits at that point. When we are hungry, and the enemy wants to take advantage of that, to present apple for us to eat. Poisoned apple, like he did to Adam and Eve. That is dangerous. Or when we have everything, we don't lack anything again. The danger of that one is that we stand the risk of not having time to serve God again. How many people God have given you a husband, given you children, given you wealth, 
you are doing so well, you live in a good house, riding a good car, I mean, everything is going fine. Now you don't have time to pray. <laughs> you see that? You, you don't have time to pray again. You are not busy. You are flying from city to city, state to state, country to country. You don't have time again to pray. You attend board meetings all the time, but you don't have time to attend prayer meetings. At that point, you are vulnerable. Has God blessed me? Yes, he has. But you, such a person is vulnerable. We should be very careful at these two points. I think there was a place in the scripture in the, that the psalmist was saying, um, was it the psalmist or Solomon? But he was saying that, uh, then God, uh, do not withhold bread from me. Um, that I may not uh, get it in a wrong way. That, that I may not uh, go and steal because I need bread to eat. And, and, and do not allow me to have excess that I may not think... Um, I, I have everything. Give me what is enough for me. Give me what's enough for the day. <laughs> okay. You see that prayer of the of the, that that prayer is 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 a prayer of a wise man. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's the Proverbs chapter thirty verse uh, nine. Okay. The service. It's not actually the service. Uh, that, that was uh, Solomon, the, the writer of Proverbs, right? Proverbs chapter 30, verse uh, 89. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that I need. Or, <laughs> listen, 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 or I shall be full, F-U-L-L, and they deny you, and say, who is the Lord? Or, listen again, or I shall be poor, and they steal, and they profane the name of my God. These are two dangerous extremes. We should not take them for granted. We should be careful when we find ourselves in these two extremes. We should stay close to God in both the good times and in the bad times. Sometimes the enemy will be fighting your resources. They will not be fighting you directly, but they can be fighting your blessings. They can be fighting the children. They can be fighting your business. But they're not fighting you directly. How oh, somebody getting this thing? But they are fighting the things around you because they know that fighting you directly is a waste of time. Because you are too prayerful. You are too, you know, committed to prayer. Your connection to God is so strong. But they can begin to fight you what you have so that you will begin to to get worried oh my child is sick oh uh johnson is not doing well at school why why what's happening to johnson johnson is not talking to anybody again johnson's behavior has changed in the, the school uh, and even this in the house everybody's complaining but it's not the, my child it's not the way my child used to behave what's wrong talk to me Oh, James is, is, is in drugs. These are attacks. These are attacks. They, they want to weaken you. They, they want to bring you to a point to question your prayer life, to, to, to make you think that you're, you're not praying, or you're not praying enough, or that you're, you are just wasting your time. 
You see that? They can make even your friends just to hate you overnight. I mean, you have not done anything wrong. There's nothing. No reason why you two of which you quarrel. No reason why this is happening. But it's happening. The ones, the people, your friends, you confide to are now the ones betraying you. That's an attack. And this is happening at the same time. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Judas betrayed him. As if that was not enough, <laughs> when the chiefs were down, his own disciples ran away. In fact, even Peter denied him. This is what happened at the same time. Why would somebody, you go to a mailbox, you receive a letter, summoning you to court, in the morning, you are wondering, uh, why, I thought that this matter is over. I thought that this divorce matter is over. And you are going to court. In the evening, you have got another court case for overspeeding to appear before the court. Then the next morning, you are filing another letter of uh, somebody that uh, is accusing you of what you didn't even know about. You come to work, you, you are someone before your, your, your boss to receive a complaint or something you never even thought of. Something you are not, you don't even know about. You come to the house to sleep, the house is, is on fire. You can't sleep. You can't find peace in the house, you can't find peace in the place of work. You are just confused. It means what? You are under attack. At that point, what the enemy is trying to do is this. He wants to begin to worry. That's what he wants to do. Because he knows that when you begin to worry, you cannot pray. Nobody worries and prays well. It cannot be so possible. You can't be worried and praying well. Uh -uh. Is that why you are worrying and not praying? Or you are praying and not worrying? You can't carry two of them at the same time. So when you begin to have an incessant worry and, and all that and, uh, uh, and everything appears to be collapsing around you as if the center cannot hold again, you know that you are under attack. At that time, get up and begin to pray. That is to say, boost your prayer life, ask for more prayers, you know, do everything that you, you need to do to be very committed in prayer. To be very committed in prayer. We have to be very committed in prayer. You see, it is better now that for us to know these signs, okay, these, um, what I call warning signs, symptoms of an impending spiritual attack than for us to just play into the hands of the enemy. You see that? <laughs> So when these things begin to happen, that is when we should begin to pray more. That is when Jesus is waiting for you, for you in the Gethsemane, telling you, come, come, let us pray. Come and join me to pray. Would you not pray with me for one hour? That's when Jesus is saying, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Look at what happened to Job. The enemy did not attack Job directly. He started with what? Attacking his blessings. By the time Job got a report that he lost all his children. Can you imagine somebody losing all his children? Job had many children. He lost all of them in a day. All of them. Is there any calamity that's more than that one? He lost all his estate, his business, his investment. He lost everything in a day. In fact, people who came to give him this news, they lined up. And each one will bring bad news. Bad news. There are people, 
people that have bad news lined up. It's a sign of an attack within you. So focus your mind, your eyes, you know, on the attacks and not on God. Get it? <laughs> Job had it rough. He had it rough. Now, at the point in the life of Job, then the enemy came to assault his health. That was an attack. That was an attack. The Bible tells us it was an attack. Because God permitted the devil to go and attack Job. So what Job experienced was attack, spiritual attack. It was manifesting physically, but that was spiritually orchestrated. And because Job didn't understand what was going on, Job did not know that he was under attack. He didn't know. And then... He was crying, even began to curse the day he was born, even cursing the day that the mother even conceived him. Even threatening to take God to court. Can you imagine that? Job was threatening, even telling the not, not, tell me where God is. Let me come there. Let us go to the court and say to this matter. And so when I read that the Bible, I said, Job, are you out of your mind? You are taking God to court? <laughs> because Job was convinced I did nothing wrong. He doesn't even deserve this he was going through. Life wasn't fair to him. Uh, life is not usually fair, though. But God was watching. And the Lord said to Job, Hey, Job, I cannot, you cannot come to, 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 to my territory and summon God to court. You can't do that. Not in my territory. The one who gave me my existence. The Sad said, No, no, Job. Don't even come near. I can't help you. The one who brought me to existence. You want to bring him to court? Who said to you, people? Job was under attack. Everywhere collapsing. Marriage collapsing. Of course, the wife, you know, denied him. Told him, cause God and die. No encouragement from the wife. At least, if Job was Getting encouragement from the wife, that is, at least we'll say, okay, let's, let's manage that one. But, but you see, the wife woke, woke from bed, from the mansion of Job, and only to see Job sleeping in the dungeon. And, he, and she came from this beautiful house and came to the dungeon where Job was sleeping and they told Job, you know what, curse God and die. Job had it rough. I thank God for the faithfulness of Job. Your case, my case, may not be as bad as that of Job, but you see, when we see the things we have, when they are falling apart, it's a sign that we're under attack. And the enemy knows how to do that. They may not waste their time to begin to fight you straight because you may be too strong in prayer. But you can go and fight your wife, fight your husband, fight your children. Fight your business. Even fight your business colleagues, your clients. They can fight it. Oh, yeah. They can fight the people who are coming to help you. <laughs> and there was a time I was uh, handling a case of a family uh, back home. And I was in the middle of that uh, spiritual attack that the family was going through. And I was always uh, with them, having a vigil, fasting with them and, you know, so I, I was in the middle of it when I got a visa to travel to overseas. And that's when I came to the United States. I faced, faced a different culture, you know, being a student, trying to familiarize with lots of things, things, lot of things happening at the same time. But then I would still be standing up for this primary and this family praying for them. Then one day, a, a spirit in charge of their problem, a spirit that was an assignment to deal with them, that spirit... I saw it in the spirit going to the family to go and attack them. I blocked it. I said, no, you can't go. And the, the spirit asked me a question that surprised me. The spirit said, 
I am only a servant. That is the spirit was telling me that that it is a servant. And of course, that is that's what it should be. He said, I'm a servant, and my my master has loaded me with 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 explosives to go and discharge into the family. I am loaded with explosives to discharge the family. So I'm only carrying out my assignment. But you are now telling me that, that I cannot go and accomplish my task, what my master told me to go and accomplish. You are the one blocking my way. And my master told me that, this, that I must return back. After discharging these explosives. And I told the spirit, surely you're not going to go there. The next thing the spirit said is that, therefore, because, because I have to discharge it before I go back, I have to discharge it on you. <laughs> Game changed. I know at that point this is war. I will begin to fight. I said, no, you cannot discharge it on me. You cannot discharge on the family. And thank God for the power of prayer who gives victory to his children. I made this reference to you to understand that in this quick story I shared with you, you see, God had positioned me to stand the guard for the family. The enemy on the way to attack them had to come and on seeing me as an obstacle began to attack me. So the enemy can attack your helper. All right? <laughs> the enemy can attack your what? Your helper. The person to help you. That is why it is important to be very prayerful. Pray even for those who are going to be uh, uh, instruments to help you. You pray for them. You stand the gap for them. Is God talking to someone tonight? If you do not pray for your angels, for your helpers, let me tell you something. You miss great miracles. If your helper is in jail, how can your helper help you? Think about that. If the man who is supposed to marry you is in jail, how can I marry a place? I've just used a physical symbolism to explain this. But you see, it's also true spiritually. If somebody who is supposed to be your spouse is spiritually in prison, how can the person even come to marry you? How can that business take place? How can that connection take place? You see that? Supposing on the day that Jesus was carrying his cross, that someone did not come. Supposing someone faced it that morning. Supposing someone had an accident. You think he would have helped Jesus to carry his cross? And if you tell me, oh, God would have brought another person, what if that, that, whoever that person would have been, that person would have represented a Simon for Jesus? What if that Simon had an accident? Even the second, what if the second one had an accident? Jesus, with the disciples, they were on the way to go to the other side of the lake. At the middle of the lake, a storm arose, and Jesus was fast asleep. But the disciples tried to calm the storm, tried to navigate the boat, no way. And they had to wake Jesus up. And Jesus spoke to the storm, and the storm was quiet. But we know that when they got to the end of the journey, Jesus delivered a, 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 someone who was a captive of the devil. A captive of the mighty. You know. A young man for years had been in chains. The devil chained him and put him. And he was living in the tombs. Cutting himself with stones. For years. 
his loved ones, his family had done their best to keep him guided, but he would break the chains, break the everything, and and and, and go free. And he was living in the tombs. Can you imagine that? But when Jesus came, Jesus delivered him, and he came back to his senses. But you see, before that deliverance took place, there was a storm on the way. The disciples of Jesus, even Jesus himself, went through storm. Your deliverance can be coming, but the one to help you can be under attack. That storm that came to the boat of Jesus and the disciples, that was an attack. I don't have much time to talk much on this. In the next volume, hopefully in volume 8, we continue with this series. We pray even now and ask the Holy Spirit who has given us this knowledge to help us to be mindful of the spiritual signs, the warning signs that suggest an encroaching enemy. We're asking the Holy Spirit who has revealed these things to us to help us to be spiritually awake. Help us, Holy Spirit. We have listened to your word. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible says, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. So, Holy Spirit, since we are the children of light, expose every darkness in us by your light. Illuminate us with your light. Take away the spirit of sleepiness in us. Let the light of Jesus shine upon us. Touch us in a special way, Holy Spirit. Saturate us with your power and give us spiritual understanding to be able to know and to, to discern circumstances that are alluding to spiritual attack. Come and help us. Take away spiritual blindedness. We need the Holy Spirit. Help us to know when there is an attack that is coming. By virtue of the message you have given to us today, may we be better informed. Give us good memory to recall things you have told us today, so that when the situation arises, when the symptoms are showing themselves, showing the ugly enemy coming, encroaching enemy, then we should be able to remember what you have told us this message and stand guard. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You are amazing. Thank you in the name of Jesus. We cover ourselves, blood of Jesus. We cover our testimonies, blood of Jesus. And we decree that no weapon formed or designed against us shall prosper. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen, and amen, and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Saint of Days. We give you glory for the great, wonderful things you have always been doing in the last of your people. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, never shall be, world without end. Amen. Hail Mary, flow of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you amongst men, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now until the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.